Welcome back to my uh, lecture on architecture and programming models for GPUs and coprocessors and to this second session. And we're still in part one on performance of computer programs. And today we will talk about uh, power consumption. We will talk about something that is called the power wall um, that led to a shift in paradigms in, uh, in, in the development of computer architectures. Um, we will also talk about uh, memory hierarchies and about memory in general. And there is a bit of time left. Um, we will also uh, start talking about parallel architectures. So let us first discuss power consumption. Like yesterday, we talked about Moore's law, and that is commonly misinterpreted um, as a doubling in performance every 18 months. And uh, like this, is a, um, this is a common misconception. and. Um, and mostly due to the fact that um, for, for like about 30, year, 30 years, um, this doubling in transistors um, was more or less directly translated into higher clock frequency. And as we saw yesterday, um, clock frequency um, directly influences performance, our measure of performance. And um, thus, what people observed was, uh, was, was effectively a doubling in performance every 18 months. So, um, um, and let's, let us discuss um, why this was even possible in the first place. Huh? So um, how was it possible that uh, vendors were able to increase um, clock, clock frequency at was, what was essentially an exponential rate? Huh? So um, and this was possible. Um, basically, this was possible because power consumption doesn't grow with the exact same rate as the number of transistors. Yeah? Um, so power consumption actually depends on the input voltage. And, um, and the inter input um, voltage is proportional to, tr to the transistor size. Um, smaller transistors require smaller input voltage. Yeah? And uh, this is obviously, this is generally a good thing. Like, um, like uh, in theory, this means um, the smaller the transistors get, the smaller is the individual power consumption um, per transistor. That is, when we uh, add more transistors, we like proportionally um, have the same power consumption overall as we had before. So the power consumption of a transistor depends on the dynamic energy. That is, for the time being, we assume that a transistor um, only consumes significant uh, energy when it actually performs a switch operation, like uh, switching from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. So for a uh, state transition 0, 1, 0 or 1, 0, 1, um, the uh, power that is con consumed is proportional to the capacitive load C times the input voltage V dd. And so for a simple switch uh, operation, uh, like uh, the energy consumption is just uh, the, the, the half of that. Yeah? So in uh, ref respect to time, um, this means um, that the overall power consumption is proportional to, uh, to, to the dynamic energy times the clock frequency. Yeah? Like um, the uh, the energy consumed per single switch times um, the number of uh, of uh, of such such uh, such straight transitions. Now uh, there's something or, or or this 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 basically defines Dennard's scaling law, which is like 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 another of those laws like or like similar to uh, to the law proposed by uh, Gordon Moore. Dennard's scaling law postulates that VDD is proportional to the transistor size, um, and that means, or, or and that implies that the uh, voltage density stays the same. Yeah? So, and therefore, when uh, transistors shrink in size, according to Moore's law, the power consumption of the uh, individual transistor goes down. And like, in fact, like 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 earlier, I said that the um, uh, that the power consumption is actually um, not proportional to uh, the transistor size, like like um, at least not linearly proportional. Well, as in fact the um, input voltage is accounted for quadratically, and when the uh, uh, input voltage goes down, um, that means um, the overall power consumption with uh, shrinking transistor size. Um, even goes down at a higher rate. Huh? So that means when the transistors get smaller, the power consumption even gets smaller. Yeah? So which, I mean, this is great, right? Um, 
we have like um, we can uh, shrink our resist our con our transistors um, according to Moore's law, and then we have Dennard scaling law, which more or less states that uh, power consumption will will uh, basically stay the same. Yeah? Like and this uh, led um, over the years to an to an exponential uh, growth in uh, clock frequency. So here again, you see one of those diagrams where I um, plotted uh, certain quantities on a logarithmic scale. And uh, what you can see here is uh, is a an increase is the increase in clock frequency over time, beginning beginning in the uh, 1980s um, up until the 2000s. And you see uh, this exponential growth rate here. And you can see that the um, power consumption um, basically stays the same. So um, it uh, grows um, at a at a lower rate than the clock frequency, as is, um, as was predicted by Dennard's scaling law. Then um, in the early 2000s, you can see uh, this shift here, where you have this plateau in uh, clock frequency, where you can see and we can observe that processors um, didn't uh, scale anymore in clock frequency. And you can see that, uh, that the power consumption goes down. So the thing here with Dennard's scaling law and the observations that we made before is um, that um, there's a, a certain type of voltage that we didn't take into account. And um, this voltage is called leakage. And you can basically think of it as a, like, a, like, a, leaking, like a leaking faucet, um, regardless of, um, of the switch operations of the transistors, um, there's always a tiny amount of energy being lost. Um, and uh, that is regardless if, of if there is a charge applied or not. This amount of leakage is actually really tiny. Like, um, like when there were only like a few thousand transistors on a ship, um, that that uh, that that was that 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 did account for nothing. Like, uh, and but the problem with uh, leakage is that it does not adhere, adhere to Dennett scaling law, and it's rather than that, it's a constant. Huh? Like when the um, transistor sizes uh, go down, uh, voltage uh, leakage uh, stays the same. Huh? So when what was formerly irrelevant um, becomes now more and more dominant. So um, and this basically means um, we still have Moore's uh, Moore's law. We get our uh, doubling in transistors um, roughly every eighteen months. So this uh, this is still the same uh, even today. Yeah? But we can effectively not use them anymore, at least not in the, in the same way we used them in the 1980s and the 1990s. Yeah. So, and in the early 2000s, this led to a development that um, people commonly referred to a phenom phenomenon called the, the power wall or the red brick wall, which would, um, which would eventually lead to this development um, coming to a, to a, to a halt. And, and as a matter of fact, people knew this. Like people in the eighties and nineties knew that uh, leakage would eventually become a problem. And um, nevertheless, the vendors um, scaled up um, clock frequency as long as they could. And then in the early two thousands, um, this was no longer possible. Yeah? And um, so, as a matter of fact, the last processor generation um, where, uh, where where this is, was actually still exercised was the uh, Intel Pentium four processor. In uh, in the in the early two thousands, um, towards two thousand four two thousand five, um, this development came to a sudden halt, and this this uh, led to this famous statement by Herb Sutter from from Microsoft, um, who said the the free lunch is over. Like there was just no no trivial um, trivial uh, scaling in performance um, due to uh, an increase. Uh, in the number of transistors, which led to an immediate increase in the clock frequency, yeah, and this was actually a real game changer, yeah. So, um, so this was what what uh, what what Herb Sutter said, like, um, like I mean, the thing is, Moore's law state still valid, yeah. Like we get this, um, this uh, doubling uh, roughly every eighteen months in transistors, we still get this, um, like 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 eventually Moore's law will also come to a halt. But um, so far it hasn't yet, so it has slowed down a bit in the last years. Uh, you can observe that actually.
the one million dollar question is actually what do what what do we do with this extra transistors if we cannot um, devote it to higher clock frequency? And um, the answers that came from the vendors from the uh, CPU manufacturers were actually quite pragmatic. Uh, like um, like what the vendors actually did, they included um, so-called dead chip elements, uh, like um, chip elements that um, that uh, didn't require a charge at all. When they were inactive, like a typical such element is like uh, is like memory, yeah? like memory. Um, when there's no relevant information in the in the uh, stored in memory, um, then you don't even need to apply power to it. Yeah? Like um, and the thing really is um, such a like a typical memory element um, that falls into the like category is a, is a cache. Yeah? So and uh, cache caches are actually um. Uh, notoriously hard to make use of. Like um, the programmer usually has a very hard time to uh, to make good use of caches, and that means um, so as the programmer is really not able to uh, to um, to most effectively like to like use caches to one hundred percent usually with uh, their applications. Um, caches are effectively dead chip elements. Um, so are additional processors actually. Yeah? Like. Um, we will learn later in the lecture that it is um, not impossible to uh, use a multi-core architecture to 100% because um, yeah, no matter how parallel your task actually is, um, you always have wait times where you have um, processors um, waiting on other processors or you have cores waiting on other cores and um, while doing so, while waiting, uh, they have no work to do and then at that time they are basically um, they basically um, consume no energy. No? Like, and there are also other means, like um, certain uh, types of registers, like vector registers, that um, where uh, vendors um, assume that they're just not not used, ever, not not used all the time. No? So basically, that means um, there are additional elements that the um, those additional uh, transistors are devoted to. And those elements are notoriously hard to program. And this is why Herb Sutter said this is the biggest sea change in software development since the object-oriented programming revolution. And uh, this is uh, called concurrency. Like, and the free lunch is over because uh, now the programmer has to, uh, the programmers have to carefully design their programs around uh, concurrency and about um, parallel programming paradigms. The problem is really that um, when we run our serial programs from the 90s or from the early 2000s, uh, they won't run any faster just by buying a faster processor. And consequently, this shift in paradigms now also results in a shift in responsibilities from the hardware vendors to the software developers, who now have to um, more carefully design their algorithms and their codes around multi-core architectures and around ZIMD vector units. And all these measures that the vendors can take to add dead ship elements to their microships, we will now discuss in the following. And we will start with memory hierarchies and caches. So computers are traditionally equipped with memory hierarchies and across the hierarchy levels, uh, memory access latencies uh, differ significantly. Like for example, um, where we have register memory where memory access latencies are in the nanoseconds or even below. And we have caches where uh, memory access latencies are in the order of like five nanoseconds. Then we have main memory with a memory access latency of 50 to 100 nanoseconds about uh, disks that are even slower. And then at the uh, lower end of the, of the spectrum, we have like backup media like like tapes etc yeah. and now the question is really um, is really on the one hand um, how often and by by which functional unit is the memory used and uh, how much data is transferred and what you usually can see with those memory hierarchies is that um, the smaller the latency um, the smaller also the granularity of data that is passed between the between the respective units. Like usually when you uh, store things to tape, then you usually have a backup of, of like a bunch of files or 
or like or like large memory movements uh, compared to register to cache movements, for example. For us, that means that memory areas that have um, low memory access latency uh, usually are are small. So, and um, that means we have to take care of that um, data items that are in memory regions that have low access latency are actually those data items that we are also going to use. And what this boils down to is that we um, take care of, care of locality. So locality here means that we're trying to keep uh, data items uh, in fast memory that we're uh, likely to access. And um, there's only one spatial spatial locality where we um, where we analyze um, what the data item is that we're currently accessing, and then we're assuming that data items that are um, adjacent in memory that we're that, that, that we're highly likely to access them to. Um, there's temporal locality, um, which means that um, when we're currently accessing certain data items, that we're that that there is a probability that we'll also uh, access those data items again. Based on that assumption, we might try to keep um, the uh, the current data item in memory for for later accesses. Um, this whole concept doesn't only apply to uh, data, but also to instructions. Like um, as we learned earlier, um, programs are made up of um, instructions and data, and whenever we um, execute a inst an instruction, it is the CPU needs needs to fetch it, fetch it from memory. And um, when, our, when instructions are reused, it is a good idea to uh, not fetch them from memory over and over again, from, from slow memory over and over again, but to keep, it, keep them in a faster, um, in, a, in a cache, sorry, in a, in, a, in a faster memory region. Like typical examples of this being loops, where you have um, a loop iteration, and then in the next loop iteration, you will, um, you're in, in all likelihood, um, you will um, execute the same instructions again. Of course, depending on branches that your program might potentially take. So obviously, the the choice of algorithms has a has a strong influence on locality. For example, if an algorithm like um, like uh, branches all the time, and every second iteration uh, has a different outcome than every first iter iteration, like every even iteration has an has a different outcome than every odd iteration. And then this is potentially bad for for instruction locality. And uh, similarly, if we have like, say we have a um, an algorithm that has memory access patterns um, where you have lots of random variables, and those random variables determine um, where you access memory, then you usually um, cannot make good use of spatial locality. Where and this, a typical example of this being Monte Carlo algorithms, uh, where you have a quite incoherent. Uh, Spatially incoherent memory accesses. Yeah, we learned earlier that uh, vendors uh, try to dodge the uh, power wall phenomenon by integrating more and bigger and uh, deeper cache hierarchies into their architectures as an alternative to increasing clock frequency. And um, we'll 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 discuss uh, why this is challenging to the programmer. Uh, and then we'll also. Later during the course of the lecture, we'll uh, discuss uh, the relevance of cache hierarchies to uh, to multi or many core architectures because uh, caches in an environment um, where they are shared actually behave quite different than in an environment where you only have a single processor or a single core accessing uh, the cache hierarchy. So, and in order to understand how caches work, um, we'll on a We'll, we'll have a look at um, how memory works on a more technical uh, level. Um, we'll uh, find out that there are two types of memory. On the one hand, there is uh, static memory, which is um, typically very fast to access, which has very low uh, access latency. But on the other hand, it's uh, is, is, uh, expensive to manufacture and uh, also uh, expensive to use. Never. Um, uh, computer systems only have a very little uh, static memory, and uh, for like for example for RAM for DDR memory, computer systems usually use dynamic memory, which is uh, way less less expensive to use, but has certain implications that uh, that um, that that increase the memory access latency uh, to this type of memory. And as we discussed earlier, it's usually very challenging to determine which data item to keep in a fast static memory 
and which data items to keep in dynamic memory. So let's have a look at those uh, different memory cells. And uh, here on the on the left hand side, I show you a, a static memory cell, and we'll go a bit into the details later. But um, suffice it to say that the design of this memory cell is much more complicated than the dynamic memory cell that I'm showing here on the right hand side. Yeah, let us um, have a look how those um, memory cells work. Um, let us start with static RAM. And we'll do this on a conceptual level, like the circuit that I'm showing here consists of um, a number of input and output lines and uh, consists of uh, six transistors, M1 through M6. Um, but what is, what is actually happening here is um, we have a, a circuit that uh, implements so-called cross-couple inverter logic, which is, which is a fancy word for um, that this circuit is actually a flip-flop. So I am assuming that this type of circuit is known from, for example, computer science too. Um, but nevertheless, as it's pretty important to the understanding of how static memory works, I'll quickly review it here. So a um, flip-flop in its most basic form is comprised of, um, of uh, two NOR gates, NOR gate number one up here, NOR gate number two down here. And um, so for your convenience, I also um, I also show you the logic, uh, the logic table of the NOR gate here on the right hand side. And um, then also we have those input lines, input line S, input line R, and we have output lines Q and Q dagger. And um, in its initial state, I assume that all the inputs and all the outputs are just, uh, just, just uh, low, that is we have zeros everywhere. And let us see what happens when I apply a high signal, a signal of 1 on the S line. Um, and at the same time, we have this uh, low signal zero from the from this feedback loop here. So we have a zero and a one that is fed into the NOR gate, and that'll um, that'll result in the Q line being low. And that low signal will now also go through the through the feedback loop to the to the to the second NOR gate. And um, due to its initial state, it also happens that the uh, that the R line is zero, but that now results in the Q dagger line uh, going going high yeah. so the output on the Q dagger line is 1 um, but that also results in that second feedback loop uh, going high and now we have uh, two high signals that are fed into uh, the NOR gate and consequently that means that it now doesn't matter anymore what uh, the uh, what the state of the S line is right like Regardless of um, whether S now is high or low, um, the flip-flop will keep its state. That is, um, the Q line will be low and the Q dagger line will be will be high. And this is uh, basically the logic how the uh, flip-flop is able to keep its state um, regardless of the uh, input signals that are currently applied. And you can play this through with this with a single single example. Um, as soon as you uh, switch the uh, R line, you will also see that the flip flop will switch its state, and then um, then you you again you can take away the signal from the R line, and you will see that the flip flop is able to keep its state. So this is the basic logic um, underlying flip flops, and this is also the basic logic that underlies the um, the static the static memories. So the main takeaway here is, um, on the one hand, that uh, static memory basically is just uh, flip-flops. And um, we also understand um, that static memory cells are relatively complex um, due to um, uh, the circuit consisting of a bunch of transistors and also um, because we uh, always need uh, input voltage applied to the circuit. Because of that, uh, static RAM is relatively expensive to manufacture and also expensive to operate. And therefore, um, in typical computer systems, um, static RAM is usually not used for um, for DDR main memory, um, only in uh, very specialized systems. Um, but it's usually used for for caches. Uh, dynamic RAM, on the other hand, is uh, much simpler. Uh, dynamic RAM. Um, basically consists of a single transistor instead of six and of a single capacitor. What is a capacitor? A capacitor is a um, small device that can uh, that can keep 
electric charge over some time, um, but then gradually discharges. Oh. So and the capacitor um, determines the charge of the of the of the memory cell, oh. and um, with a, a discharging uh, element like a capacitor, you uh, don't have to apply uh, charge all the time, but only in order to uh, to uh, recharge the capacitor if this is desired. So, and in order to a, apply a high signal uh, to uh, this dynamic uh, memory cell, you just charge the capacitor. No? So, there are several cons to uh, dynamic memory cells. On the one hand, um, a real problem here is leakage. Like, the capacitor um, must be refreshed um, after some time. Like, there is a, a constant refresh cycle in order um, to uh, for for the memory cells uh, to keep it to keep to keep their state, like there's significant leakage, oh. and during those refresh cycles, um, the memory cell cannot also cannot be read from. Oh. What what actually adds to the problem is that memory cells are usually densely packed, and um, for that reason, uh, we can uh, we can really uh, never uh, charge uh, this those capacitors to their full capacity. And uh, this, of course, again adds to this effect because um, the 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 refresh the refresh cycles are actually shorter. Huh? And on top of that, also the capaci capacitor uh, loses its sh its charge when we read from it. And then, um, as the uh, capacitor signal is notoriously low, we also have to amplify the signal. And then also, um, when we read from the uh, from the dynamic memory cell. Um, the signal that we obtain is not is not is not uh, is not a rectangular signal uh, because the capacitor and the charge and the discharge of the capacitor is not instantaneous. No? So and for those reasons, we have to be quite conservative when we can actually read from those dynamic memory cells. Like for example, we have to be careful um, only to read when the signal is sufficiently amplified or when the signal uh, isn't uh, interrupted by a refresh cycle, etc. And um, all those factors add to uh, the memory access latency, which is significantly higher than with static RAM. Oh. Yeah, and for those reasons, as we have on the one hand, um, have uh, static memory cells that have, uh, that have, that have a very low memory access latency, um, but are um, expensive to operate, and on the other hand, we have dynamic memory cells that are um, relatively cheap to operate, um, but have very high memory access latency, and also aren't as reliable as the static memory cells. Um, CPU memory hierarchies are organized in a way where we have um, where we have uh, caches that are very near to the CPU, that are composed of uh, static memory cells, and then we usually have main memory that is comprised of dynamic memory cells. So, um, and with that, we have to take care of locality and we have to um, make educated decisions which memory items actually to keep in the cache and which uh, items to refetch from main memory. And uh, one common strategy there is uh, so-called prefetching and the principle behind this is, uh, is spatial locality the principle that data items that are adjacent to the currently accessed data item um, are likely to be accessed uh, in by the by the by the next uh, instructions that are executed, and um, prefetching basically works by um, when we fetch data from the cache uh, fr from the main memory into the cache, we don't just uh, fetch a single item, but we uh, fetch a bunch of items, and um, this happens with the granularity of uh, of what is called a cache line, um, which is basically the uh, elementary unit um, of the number of bytes that are uh, that are that are fetched uh, when we access main memory. Uh, so when we access main memory, we don't just fetch like uh, one data item, like uh, two bytes or whatever we want to access, but we um, fetch uh, like usually on sixty-four bit system uh, sixty-four bytes at once, and um, then we. Uh, access the two bytes that we're interested in uh, for the cache and we also store the remaining 62 bytes uh, in the cache. So and this basically implements uh, spatial locality. This is based on the principle of spatial locality. So and with those principles of memory hierarchies and um, 
storing data items that are accessed often in uh, caches that are nearby the CPU, another problem arises. And um, this is the problem of um, where exactly um, to uh, in the cache to store um, which data item, depending on um, where in main memory it is located. And in order to determine that, caches um, or cache hierarchies implement something that is called associativity. And um, associativity basically helps us retrieve data items from the cache and find out um, which data item in the main memory they belong to. Caches are subdivided into sets and only certain uh, memory items from main memory can be, be written into those sets. And the um, uh, cache lines are tagged with meta information and that meta information can be used to uh, retrieve the main memory address. When like the cache is subdivided into sets, the uh, cache line will store which cache set it's, it belongs to and it will store a uh, offset into the cache and uh, that mapping set and offset uh, to main memory is unique and therefore um, we can find out which main memory data item the current cache entry belongs to. I want to use this illustration to introduce some terminology. We see here, see here at the top um, we see main memory and we see at the bottom we see a cache and we see that this cache is divided into sets. Um, in this uh, case it is divided into two sets and therefore um, we have a, an associative cache. And we also see that each set uh, consists of three entries. And uh, therefore we say that we have a three-way uh, associative cache. So there's uh, certain flavors to cache associativity. And it, in its most extreme case, we have uh, fully associative caches. Uh, that just means um, we basically have just uh, one single cache set. and. Uh, uh, each uh, each uh, cache line can just be written anywhere. Uh, like, so the problem here is, um, like, say we uh, want to access a data item, and before we access it from main memory, uh, well, we know the main memory address. Um, then we first want to check if that item is already in the cache. Um, we have to perform linear searches through the cache, like the cache lines aren't tagged anymore with uh, uh, with a with a cache set. They only have the the offset. And then we have to iterate over each and every item in the cache and we uh, compare the offset against the main memory address. And this is uh, obviously only practical for very small caches. Um, so um, nowadays most caches are either four-way or uh, two-way uh, set associative. And this is kind of a middle ground between uh, fully associative caches and uh, between direct map caches. Like direct map caches um, that you have a uh, unique web mapping um, from uh, from from each and every main memory uh, item to uh, to its cache set. Like there is really only one slot that a memory item can be written to. Um, this this has the advantage that a retrieval is very fast, but the internal logic uh, to implement this this on the ship uh, is is rather complex um, because this is done this is done uh, using multiplexers and um, so let me briefly illustrate to you what a multiplexer actually is. A uh, multiplexer is a piece of circuitry that um, retrieves a couple of inputs uh, and produces a single output. And in order to determine what the output is, um, there is a select line, and the select line will uh, choose uh, one of the single one of the single inputs. Uh. So that's actually a very basic circuitry that is uh, used quite often in uh, in, in, in microchips and the thing with like like this construct is actually pretty similar to like like if you're if you're a more software person um, think of this as a as a switch case statement uh, from from high level programming language itself and this is basically a switch case statement uh, on the hardware level the problem with this uh, with the switch case statement is that um, on the hardware level, there is only a uh, constant number of inputs, and um, if you uh, want to go wider, that is, if you want to allow for more inputs, uh, you have to build hierarchies of uh, of multiplexers. Yeah? As you can see here on this side, like you have a bunch of multiplexers that um, provide uh, that that are uh, that are given uh, given inputs. And that way, uh, you can have like a bunch of different inputs into the whole circuit. Huh? 
And then um, you have those uh, multiplexers and um, the uh, output of those multiplexers uh, is again rerouted into, into another uh, multiplexer that combines the, uh, the inputs from the, from, the, from, the, from the multiplexers that are on, the, on a lower hierarchy level. So in order to um, build uh, larger switch cases, so to say, uh, we uh, need deeper hierarchies of multiplexers. So and as we use multiplexer hierarchies uh, to build direct map caches, this obviously doesn't also doesn't scale so well. Like on a theoretical um, level, direct map caches have like uh, constant time accesses, like an access to an to a to a to an array. Huh? But on a hardware level, um, we buy this with higher complexity and um, deeper multiplexer hierarchies. And this can actually have an, have an, have an adverse effect in that, uh, in that uh, due to this added complexity, uh, memory access latency can actually become higher. Yeah. So uh, those are the, uh, uh, the uh, basic type of, types of associativity. And, um, and nowadays, almost, almost all caches, um, almost all data caches employ uh, set associativity. So uh, speaking of caches and um, speaking of uh, prefetching, and this is basically what we uh, what we uh, discussed before. Like we have cache lines, and we we uh, prefetch a bunch of data items at once. Um, obviously, problems uh, arise with uh, memory access uh, incoherency, right? Like when we have memory access patterns that are like the ones here above, like um, where we like randomly access. Uh, certain main memory items, and then uh, prefetch neighboring items and write them to the cache line. This is obviously problematic, as we'll uh, often have uh, data items in the cache that uh, aren't likely to be accessed in the next in the next few clock cycles. Huh? So, and since memory access coherency is so important, it is uh, often worthwhile to reformulate our algorithms and to try to, to make their memory access patterns more cache friendly. And there are certain measures that we can take. And although this is not trivial, there's like, like, like a tool set of, uh, of strategies that you can usually imply. And um, one such, such strategy is to, um, to sort and then compact the data. So and sorting and compaction is such an important strategy and also a strategy that I'll, uh, that I'll uh, mention throughout the lecture. I'll give you a bit of a more detailed overview how sorting and compaction works. So what we are given is um, is a region of memory with a bunch of data items in there, and then we have incoherent memory accesses. The order of the accesses I um, I labeled I labeled T here, like indicating that those are incoherent in time, but generally they're just um, incoherent memory accesses. Huh? So what we do then is um, we sort the data items by the order in which they are accessed. And uh, this can be done using, as so we have um, fixed width indices um, and fixed width addresses, we can use an efficient O of N sorting algorithm, such as counting sort or radix sort. Yeah? And what we end up with is uh, a region of memory uh, that is sorted by memory accesses. And you can also see we have fewer accesses than we have uh, data items. And uh, not all data items are actually accessed. So the next step that follows is uh, that we compact that re that that uh, that that region of memory, in that we just get rid of all the data items that aren't accessed. Sorting and compaction is a quite common strategy to improve memory access coherency. So it's important to keep in mind how that actually works. And I will mention the strategy from time to time. Nevertheless, it's important to keep in mind that um, that those operations aren't exactly cheap. Like sorting isn't isn't exactly cheap. So we always have to to uh, to to perform measurements and use profilers in order to determine if this optimization is actually worthwhile. In the uh, presence of um, architectures that have um, have deeper and also more complicated cache hierarchies, um, strategies like sorting and compaction become more and more important. So as you can see, caches and cache hierarchies have become uh, quite a bit more complicated over the years.
So and one reason for uh, cache hierarchies being more complicated nowadays is uh, also the fact that architectures are uh, more concurrent. So nowadays we often have processors that have um, 8 or 12 or even more cores and each of those cores has uh, its own L1 cache and um, maybe has shared cache, um, shared L2 cache that it shares with the other cores. And this uh, makes uh, cache hierarchies uh, even more complicated. So far we have talked about how uh, hardware vendors um, use caches and cache hierarchies to make better use of those extra transistors we get every year uh, from Moore's law. And we also learned that another strategy is uh, to, uh, by the vendors is to uh, add more concurrency, uh, to make architectures more parallel. And um, like when we think of parallelism, what uh, usually comes to mind is uh, multi-core architectures. Um, and what we also think of um, when we hear parallelism is like um, as like network computers that um, work concurrently. Like when you when you have a supercomputer that is um, comprised of uh, several machines that are connected by a, a fast network and that can uh, work in conjunction. But as a matter of fact, um, parallelism has uh, has been there from uh, day one. Um, and parallelism um, always manifested um, in terms of instruction level parallelism, um, where the CPU is able to retire certain instructions in parallel. For example, um, so just imagine the CPU has uh, multiple ALUs and uh, the CPUs um, make, make use of this type of parallelism um, without the programmer actually noticing. Like there's a certain knowledge of the of the internals that might be helpful to the programmer so that uh, that they can design the algorithms around that knowledge. Um, but it's uh, um, this type of parallelism is just not directly uh, controllable in that we um, don't have means like um, threads or, or certain 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 special operations like uh, vector operations or um, or networking APIs where we can directly make use of this of this type of parallelism. So, and what we find is that there is not just one type of parallelism, but instead there is a whole spectrum of uh, multiple uh, ways that parallelism is uh, exposed by processor architectures. And um, so, on the left hand side of that spectrum, we have um, a very technical, uh, hardware-oriented type of, uh, of concurrency and of parallelism. And this type of parallelism tends to be um, not so much exposed to the programmer. And the more we move uh, to the right si to the right hand side, um, the more the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ability to control parallelism and uh, how, con how parallelism is made use of by the program, um, switches more and more from uh, the the hardware and from the hardware designers over to uh, to the compilers and to the people who control uh, how the compilers generated code generate code over to the to the software developer that uses the hardware and that and, the, and the, who uses the compiler. And um, the more we move to this right hand side, uh, the more uh, the more um, control um, is granted to the software software uh, developer, and um, the more high level the APIs become. So, and we'll uh, in the following uh, discuss um, this whole spectrum of concurrency, and we will uh, we will start on the very left hand side at the hardware level and the uh, first. Uh, type of concurrency that we will discuss is instruction level parallelism and um, uh, in this regard we will discuss a technique that is called pipelining and the pipelining actually plays a very important role on a on a on a hardware level um, but pipelining is also important um, like for for compilers that try to find optimal program uh, layouts um, pipelining will play an important role throughout the lecture, like when we later discuss the graphics pipeline. Um, uh, there are certain concepts that uh, that 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 can re that are directly applicable 
um, that we that we learn about today. So pipelining is um, mostly motivated by a by a metaphor um, based on conveyor belts uh, for manufacturing, where you have um, yeah where you have your conveyor belt and then you have multiple uh, stages and uh, those stages perform operations on the yeah, on the data item that are passed through the stages and all the stages obviously um, work in parallel and the data items are like streamed uh, streamed by means of the conveyor belt through all the stages. And then there are like fixed intervals um, when the when the data items are passed to the next stage. And the conveyor belt actually um, this this actually actually um, describes something that is very important, which is the data flow. So this is a very very data centric view that concentrates on the data flow, and where we have a pipeline layout uh, that 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 is that is data flow centric. So um, let us have a look at how pipelining uh, lining works, and let us have a look at how the uh, compiler uh, pipelines instructions. And for that, we again uh, consider our uh, Zaxby example, and. Um, like let me uh, like like let, let me quickly recap how that works. Um, we uh, have our C function that performs this vector operation, where we have a vector x and a vector vector y and a scalar a, and then we perform this multiplication and uh, this addition. And um, on top of that, we also have uh, have memory movement, uh, like uh, as we have to uh, load the data from memory that we're later gonna. Um, gonna 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 um, multiply and add, and then eventually, when we performed our operation, we'll store it back to memory. And then we have this uh, this loop here that is um, uh, that is uh, data independent in the sense that um, each loop iteration is uh, is independent of all the other loop iterations. So, so and um, therefore. Um, let us let us just assume that we have a compiler and the compiler translates um, uh, the body of the loop. So it translates each loop iteration into uh, into 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 this into this uh, pack of pseudo instructions. Yeah, we saw that before when we like yesterday when I showed you the compiler explorer tool. I showed you um, how the the compiler would uh, turn that program into x86 instructions, and we also learned about uh, the significance of this uh, of, uh, of 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 fixed lengths and of dynamic lengths uh, of of those arrays. And uh, we saw that that um, in particular, if the compiler was able to unroll that loop, then it would generate something like this. Huh? Like it would first of all, it would load the data, and we're here. We are simplifying a lot here. Like. We're now assuming that all the data can be loaded at once, um, which makes makes uh, things uh, simpler for us to 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 discuss later on. And then uh, we assume that there are two arithmetic operations, like there is a multiplication and there is an addition. And then in the end, uh, we store the result back back to memory. So it's for us, it's not not so important which at, at the moment which registers are used. It's just important which type of operation we use. So, and um, say the uh, the compiler was able to unroll the loop, then a um, naive schedule uh, for the loop which looked like would look like some would look like something like this. Like we have like we have uh, n loop iterations, and they can be unrolled. So we'll have the first loop iteration first, huh? and then we have the second loop iteration right after the first iteration. We have the third iteration right after the second iteration, and the fourth, and so on. Huh? So and now um, let's imagine we have a hypothetical machine where um, we have um, we have a single clock cycle latency per both arithmetic and per memory instructions, right? Like this is uh, really like a very simplified example. This is uh, usually not; those are usually not the latencies that we have. But uh, just let's just assume that, uh, and then uh, let us also assume that we can um, that you can execute um, one memory instruction and one arithmetic instruction at the same time. Yeah, like like um, exactly one uh, memory instruction and exact, exactly one arithmetic instru instruction. Yeah. 
And um, based on that knowledge, we could schedule the, uh, the loop differently. Like, um, we could actually pipeline the loop. Um, what does that mean? Like we have our uh, first uh, load instruction. So we, uh, we uh, use the unit that is responsible for memory operations. Huh? So we obviously we have a data dependency, like we have to uh, load the, f the, the data items before we can perform the multiplication. Huh? And um, so then we perform the multiplication afterwards. We are still in the first loop iteration now. But um, while we um, perform the multiplication, the, um, the, um, the, the uh, unit that is concerned with memory operations is already free. No? And that means um, we can now, at some time, at some point in time, we can uh, already start loading uh, the data from, for the next loop iteration, uh, although we are not finished with the, with the arithmetic from the first loop, uh, loop iteration yet. No? So, and uh, as we can only perform uh, from uh, one load and one, um, one uh, arithmetic operation at a time, we'll uh, come to this, to this uh, schedule here, where we basically interleave um, load operations and arithmetic operations. Huh? And as you can see, at each uh, point in time, um, we perform one arithmetic operation and we perform one memory iteration. Huh? And uh, effectively, we have this uh, parallelized our program in a sense that we um, that we could currently use the memory management unit that is concerned with uh, memory movements and the ALU, the arithmetic logical unit that is concerned with arithmetic operations. So, and you can see that this was effective. Like um, if I simply count the clock cycles um, that are required for the four loop iterations. Um, I would see that those are uh, four clock cycles that are required, um, as opposed to the 16 clock cycles um, that we needed before for, for the naive schedule. And with this uh, particular schedule, uh, you can see that the next loop iteration can always be scheduled after, um, after two clock cycles, uh, after uh, two instruction was performed. And we call this, uh, those two clock cycles, uh, we call this the initiation interval. Yeah, let us generally define some terminology. We already talked about the initiation interval, which is the uh, number of clock cycles uh, that is required to schedule the next, the next loop iteration. And then we have the prologue, and the prologue is the number of clock cycles until, until the pipeline is completely filled. That is, um, until there are enough iterations, um, until every functional unit can uh, work concurrently. Um, the ensuing phase is called the kernel, where the pipeline is full and there's, there are enough instruction to uh, make, make good use of the available functional units. And then after some time, um, when, the, uh, when the loop finishes, um, the pipeline, pipeline will eventually run empty. And um, we call uh, this uh, phase um, of the pipeline, we call this the epilogue. Huh? And we can also observe a few things. Um, first and foremost, uh, when we um, consider a single iteration, a single loop iteration, the uh, sequence of the operations uh, stays the same. So um, what, uh, what really improves is throughput. And we can also see that the time complexity um, of a pipeline loop now depends on the initiation interval. Like um, the initiation interval determines uh, at which rate we can uh, schedule a new loop. So and effectively, the initiation interval is also what we want to want to minimize. Huh? And um, when I'm saying minimize, you can already see that uh, pipelining is a is an optimization problem. Like usually in a pipelining problem, um, single loop iterations. Uh, aren't nearly as simple uh, as the one that I showed you earlier. And even the one I showed you earlier, I simplified quite a bit in that I combined move operations uh, in that I assumed that uh, there are certain conditions uh, like the latency of the two instructions being the same, uh, that there is an infinite amount of registers, etc. Pipelining is mostly hidden from the programmer, so the uh, programmer will never explicitly program the pipeline uh, anyway, like when you're on a on an architecture where you know 
that there is a relatively deep pipeline, um, that the architecture supports relatively deep pipelines, you, you can account for this in your programs by favoring algorithms that have a relative, that have relatively lo uh, long loop iterations. And loops that have uh, relatively long iterations are, are thus uh, not dominated by either the epilogue or by the prologue of the loop. So, um, as I already said, um, pipelining per se is, a, is an optimization problem. And the uh, optimization problem can be formulated as follows. Um, what we want to find is, a, is an instruction schedule that minimizes the initiation interval. And uh, we also want the schedule to be valid. Uh, um, we want it to be valid on the one hand with respect to the available resources, like um, when we have only one memory management unit and we have only one ALU, um, we have to make sure that we use exactly those resources. Or if we have like um, a certain number of registers available with our instruction set, uh, then we have to make sure that we use exactly that number of registers and that we don't use more. And the schedule also has to stay uh, as to as to be valid with respect to data dependencies uh, between instructions. So what are data dependencies? Data dependencies exist everywhere where we have instructions that depend on uh, results from our prior instructions. Like for example, in the like in the example before, we had um, at two arithmetic instructions, and um, the first arithmetic instruction depended on the on the load instruction from before, and the uh, second arithmetic instruction depends on this on the on the on the first arithmetic instruction. No? Resource availability can refer to a bunch of things, and in the examples that we'll. Uh, uh, considering the following, resources uh, will be will be uh, ALUs or memory management units MMUs. Yeah, but in reality, there are often uh, often different type of things. Like for a for an optimizing compiler, they are quite often, for example, for example, registers. So, and in order to obtain schedules that are valid with respect to data dependencies, and um, schedules that are valid with respect to resource availability, there's a couple of tools that we can use. And um, I will uh, introduce those tools in the following. And with respect to data dependencies, the tool that we use is the data dependency graph. Um, let us first discuss different types of uh, data dependencies. And for that, we will consider the simple loop again, the, the uh, ZXP loop. And in, its, in the form uh, that we that we encountered it before, um, we have only so-called intra-iteration data dependencies. Um, that is, um, each iteration on its own is dependent of all the other iterations. But um, particular instructions depend on instructions from before. Yeah? Like for example, before we can actually operate on the data, we have to load the data first. And uh, before we can perform the addition, we first have to perform the multiplication. And before we can store the result, we have to first compute the result. So uh, those are called intra-iteration dependencies. Uh, and then in order to uh, demonstrate what an intra-iteration uh, data dependency would look like, I uh, modified this loop a little bit. And I, um, I modified it in a way so that the um, that the loop indices are a bit different. Huh? And as you can see here, um, is that I um, access this um, array y with, a, with, an with an index that refers to a uh, loop iteration um, with a um, what we call a distance to. Huh? So I access uh, a result that was written in the in the in the uh, in in two loop, loop iterations before the current one. Huh? So uh, this is a, a classical inter-iteration data dependency. Uh, and I also placed a bit of a decoy here in that I um, also used this uh, modified uh, loop index to access the array x. And, um, and um, this is not really a uh, data dependency um, as the vector x is never really written to. Yeah? So like it doesn't really matter for the for in in terms of data dependencies um, what the index is with uh, with which I uh, access that array x. So this is a bit of a decoy. This is no real data dependency yeah? because um, the access to the array x doesn't depend on a result that was formally stored like in a in a previous loop iteration. Yeah? 
So, and uh, based on that knowledge, we can uh, define what a data dependency graph is. And a uh, data dependency uh, graph is a uh, is a uh, directed graph, and uh, the edges of that graph um, represent data dependencies, and the edges are labeled, and the edges are labeled with their delay, and the delay is just the latency in clock cycles that it uh, takes the instruction to execute. Huh? And uh, the edges are also labeled with their distance, and the distance basically reflects the inter-iteration uh, data dependencies um, like we just discussed. <clears throat> so, and here on the slide, I, um, um, I, I, I show you the data dependency graph for the first loop that only exhibits intra-iteration data dependencies. So, I can, you can see for each iteration, the first, um, the first operations that need to be performed are load operations. Um, we have to uh, load the value of the scalar a, we have to load the value of x, huh? and the multiplication depends on both. So we uh, label those directed edges, and we, we label them with the latency of the, the instructions. And we are assuming, for the sake of this example, that uh, memory access latency is, uh, uh, is uh, four clock cycles, and that the latency of an arithmetic instruction, like a multiplication or an addition, uh, 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 is, 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 is just one. Yeah? So one clock cycle for an arithmetic operation. So the multiplication depends on the two loads uh, and um, the addition depends on the result of the multiplication and uh, the latency for the multiplication is, uh, is one. The distance again is zero as we're only having uh, intra-iteration data dependencies but the result of the addition also depends on the on the on the on the value of the vector y and so we also uh, depend on the load instruction for the vector y, which again is a, a memory access instruction um, with a latency of 4. And then uh, finally we store our result and um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, write instruction, the store instruction, depends on the result of the addition. And um, the, um, the addition has a, a latency of 1. It's, um, a latency of one clock cycle, so the respective edge is uh, labeled with, with uh, just that. So uh, that's the data dependency graph for the uh, first loop that I showed, showed you earlier with only intra-iteration data dependencies. And now let's have a look at the uh, data dependency graph for the second loop. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this one is mostly the same, no? like um, we have the multiplication and the multiplication depends on the value of a and on the value of the vector uh, x that we, that, that we access where we have this decoy data dependency. No? So everything looks the same here uh, with the same latency with the same distance. No? And then we have the addition and the addition depends on the, um, on the uh, value of this vector, of this vector y. Uh, so the load iteration, uh, the load operation, the load instruction still uh, has a latency of four clock cycles. Everything stays the same, and also the addition stays the same. Yeah, and um, then we finally store the result. Yeah, and um, the only thing that we now introduce is um, this data dependency of the um, load instruction for the for the value of y, and uh, this load, um, on the one hand, um, depends on the store, um, on, uh, on this write operation, with a uh, latency of 4, um, but also, as we're accessing the vector y with a distance of 2, um, we also have, a, have, have this distance label here. No? So, th this is how we, in the, in the data dependency graph, uh, how we uh, express those uh, inter- uh, inter-iteration inter data dependencies. So, and as we discussed earlier, our schedule doesn't only need to be valid with respect to data dependencies, but also with respect to the available resources and the means to ensure this, and that we will discuss in the following our so-called reservation tables. And what are reservation tables? Reservation tables are just binary tables that are um, two-dimensional 
and a one dynamic dimension is devoted to clock cycles and it's just labeled from zero, one, and so on for each clock cycle. And the uh, uh, other dimension is devoted for, to the available resources like the available MMUs or the available uh, ALUs. And each instruction has, an, uh, has one or more reservation tables associated with it. And um, each, each reservation table encodes one possible way to schedule the instructions the instruction with respect to the available resources. And we can also use reservation tables to, uh, to, uh, to schedule combined instructions. Um, let us first look at the simple example with uh, only a single instruction. And here I show you uh, two alternatives for the, the same instruction. And we're assuming that we're on a hypothetical CPU and the CPU has two ALUs and one memory management unit. And uh, we are considering the LD instruction, the load instruction. And as we learned before, on a, on a real machine, the load instruction will, uh, will of course perform memory movements. But um, in the presence of caches, it's like, like a re reasonable thing to assume that the load instruction also performs some type of arithmetic, like, like computing an offset or something. Yeah? So we just assume that on our machine, the load instruction requires one clock cycle ALU followed by two clock cycles MMU. And um, on our machine, we have two ALUs and one MMUs, one MMU. And this gives us uh, two possible reservation tables. So um, the clock cycles on the MMU can only be scheduled on the one MMU that is available to us. But for the ALU, we can make a choice. We can uh, either schedule the single clock cycle on ALU 0 or on ALU 1. So those are two alternative reservation tables for the, uh, for the load instruction on this machine. Let us now discuss reservation tables for, com for a combined set of instructions. And for that, we again consider this simple loop from before. And what we want to do, we want to schedule a single loop iteration. And we're again on a machine similar to before, where uh, memory instructions require one clock cycle ALU and two clock cycles MMU. And let us assume that um, arithmetic instructions, like the addition and multiplication, um, take one clock, clock cycle each. And other than before, we, have, we are now in a machine where we only uh, have a single ALU and we also have one MMU. We also simplify things a bit in that um, uh, when we schedule this loop, we assume that there is a single load instruction required to load all the data, followed by the two arithmetic operations, by the multiplication and by the addition, um, which again is followed by a single store. Under those assumptions, this is the, uh, the, uh, the reservation table that we would obtain. Like um, first, we have the combined load instruction where we first compute an offset um, where we need one clock cycle ALU. We then um, have two clock cycles MMU to actually load the data. We then perform the multiplication, which, um, requires, uh, which requires one clock cycle ALU. The second arithmetic operation, the addition, requires another clock cycle ALU. Um, and this is followed by the store operation, which again is a, uh, is a, is a memory instruction. And as we said before, memory instructions um, require one clock cycle ALU and require two clock cycles MMU. So um, what we have here is the schedule for, is a, is a valid schedule for this, uh, for, this, uh, for this loop iteration. So and now that we have found a valid schedule for the first loop iteration, let us consider what we have to do to find a uh, schedule for not only one loop iteration, but for two loop iterations. Yeah? So what we're doing is we, um, we partially unroll this loop so that we have two loop iterations and we want, want to uh, find a valid schedule for both of them. And therefore, we compute something that is called um, the vector of the forbidden latencies. How that works um, is expressed in this formula here. And I will also show you how this works uh, uh, using, using a quick. So, and here in this illustration, what you see is the table from the, from the slide from before with the uh, MMU and the ALU and um, the, uh, the respective reservations. 
regarding to the uh, respective clock cycles. And what we now do is um, we first fix our, our I, um, which is the resource that we're interested in, and we'll start with, our re with the resource N on U. So, and uh, now what we want to do is we want to uh, build up the vector of uh, forbidden latencies. And for that, what we have to fix is um, both a K and a J, and those Ks need to be different, and the J is always smaller than K, right? So um, let us start with this pair, um, with the pair K is two, K equals two, and J equals one. And this gives us our first forbidden latency. Um, so the first latency where we know um, this is uh, not the latency where we can schedule the second iteration, right? And um, so um, the first forbidden latency is one. Right? So we may not schedule our, um, our second iteration uh, after one clock cycle. Right? So from there, we, we move on and um, pick the next pair of distinct k's and j's. And um, let us fixate um, k equals 6 and um, j equals 1. And this gives us our next forbidden latency, um, which is 5. Huh? So we also may not schedule the second iteration after, uh, after 5 clock cycles. And the next forbidden latency that we compute, that we calculate for the MMU, um, is uh, 6 minus 2 is 4. Then we pick our next pair um, of k's and j's, and um, let's just uh, pick k equals 7 and j equals 2, and we find um, that uh, this forbidden latency we already encountered is 5. So um, we can, or we don't necessarily have to add this to the to, to the vector of forbidden latency. So, yeah. so and the uh, next forbidden latency that we encounter is, is actually also in the vector, yeah. like this one. And then um, we encounter, or uh, we pick the pair 7 and 1. And you can also see um, from how I'm picking those pairs that the order is kind of arbitrary. Yeah? And this is also expressed in the equation from before. Like there's uh, there's no no significance to the sequence that I'm picking here. Yeah? So, and this gives us our next forbidden latency. We also know that we uh, cannot schedule the second iteration in, uh, in, um, in, 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 uh, in clock cycle number six. So, and uh, from there, we switch to the next resource. So our i now becomes ALU. Uh, and we again pick uh, pairs of k's and j's. Uh, and k's is always bigger than j. And, um, we uh, get our next forbidden latency, which is free. Yeah. And then uh, we move on from there uh, and encounter more forbidden latencies. Huh? Um, and until we finally have filled our vector of forbidden latencies, yeah? and um, the vector of forbidden latencies with respect to the resources is just uh, the vector that I that I show you. Yeah? So we can also um, write this down in a, in, a, in, a, in a bit more structured way. And then we will find that uh, the vector of forbidden latencies with respect to MMU is this one here. And uh, this here is the vector of forbidden latencies for the ALU. And we will also find that um, the um, smallest um, clock cycle that is not in, uh, in, not, a, not, a, not, in not, not in either of the two vectors is uh, the clock cycle um, number seven. And this tells us that we can schedule the uh, second loop iteration in clock cycle seven. Yeah, and um, I mean this makes sense as uh, in clock cycle number seven, we uh, we're using MMU, um, and that means we can uh, overlap the uh, one clock cycle A ALU from the from the memory access instruction with that one clock cycle MMU. As I told you before, instruction scheduling is an optimization problem and it is actually a hard optimization problem. This is because most of the loops that we uh, usually see in practice aren't as simple as the loop that we saw before. And so in order to uh, schedule and to pipeline a loop, the uh, compiler uh, performs a, a optimization problem and as the optimization problem is hard, it does so by incorporating heuristics. And um, I'll now show you how the aforementioned 
um, uh, uh, two approaches, that of uh, finding valid, valid schedules and using data dependency graphs and using reservation tables for that can be used to uh, devise relatively efficient heuristics for that. And for that, we will first consider a naive approach to find a schedule for a for a loop. And for that, we will consider this uh, this very hypothetical loop. We just have um, like um, those five instructions here, and those uh, make up the loop iteration. And then um, we have a loop with this uh, um, signified by this by this uh, jump instruction here, and the loop is executed four times. A naive method would see us uh, unrolling the loop, and then just testing different initiation intervals, right? We are after an initiation interval um, that gives us a valid schedule. Yeah? So the first thing that we would do, we would unroll the loop, huh? and then we would just test a bunch of iteration, uh, test a bunch of uh, initiation intervals. Like we would uh, start with one, we would start with an initiation interval of one, and we would test it, and then we would maybe find that the initiation interval is invalid. Huh? And then we would um, try the next init possible initial interval, which would be two, and so on, until we maybe maybe finally find, just for the sake of this example, that the valid initiation interval that gives us a valid schedule is is four. Uh, and yes, as you can imagine, this is quite tedious. Uh, like when you have a uh, loop with lots of iterations and with lots of branches and with a high high resource demand. And maybe also a loop um, that is that is uh, longer than four, like I say, maybe it's a dynamic loop or as a as a uh, large loop iteration count. Then this is actually a very tedious task. Huh? The methods that I showed you earlier um, can be used to devise more efficient methods, huh? and those methods um, usually see us first um, not unroll the whole loop, um, but only. Un unrolling the first two loop iterations, huh? and then we would uh, find an initiation interval, a valid initiation interval uh, for uh, those two loop iterations. Huh? So we would first uh, find the resource constraint um, initiation interval, uh, the minimum resource constraint initiation interval, and therefore we would use uh, resource tables. And then we would also find uh, the recurrence constraint minimum initiation interval, um, which is given by the data dependency graph. Huh? So we end up with two initiation intervals. We don't know yet yet what the uh, valid initiation interval for the whole loop is. The only thing that we know is um, it is at least the maximum of those two. Yeah? When the data dependency graph says we have a, a um, initiation interval that is two, and the resource table initiation interval uh, is one, then the valid initiation interval has to be at least the maximum of the two, yeah? so then it would be two. And uh, let us assume that for the sake of the example. And um, now that we have the minimum initiation interval for a single loop, we, could, we would then unroll the whole loop. And we would do the same iteration that I, sh that I showed you before, but with the knowledge that the valid initiation interval for the whole loop is a modulus of the of the um, the the initiation interval for only two loop iterations. Yeah, that is um, the valid initiation interval modulo the initiation interval that we computed for the for the for the two uh, iterations um, would be zero, and that is very helpful because now when we increment the initiation interval to test if the initiation interval is valid, we don't increment by one but we incre increment by that initiation interval that we computed for only two loop iterations. Huh? And this is very powerful because it reduces the, uh, the asymptotic complexity of this. And here is a slide with a cleaner presentation of this algorithm. What we are after, um, what we are first after is a lower bound for, for the initiation interval. Huh? Therefore, we compute the maximum of the resource constraint and of the recurrence constraint minimum initiation intervals, so the minimum initiation intervals with respect to resources and with respect to data dependencies with respect to recurrence and the data dependency graph. And then we set our initial initiation interval uh, to that minimum initiation interval, which is the maximum of the two mini minimum, minimum initiation intervals. And only then, then we unroll the loop and uh, then we try to find um, a valid schedule by incrementing this initiation interval. And as we know,
that the initiation interval modulo that minimum initiation interval that we computed earlier will be zero. We can, it, can in, increment it in steps of um, MII and not in steps of one. So this is probably a good point to stop for today because we learned, learned a lot today. Like we uh, learned about memory and we learned about caches and uh, now we learned about um, instruction level parallelism on a, on a very technical level and next time we're going to extend that and learn more about um, concurrency on a more developer-centric level. And yeah, I hope you, you will, will join me next week.